Hello and welcome back to the universe of God. Here is where we discover the truth and we uncover the mysteries found in God's great kingdom in his universe. And I am so glad that you are tuning in and uh, going on this journey with me into the Hebrew alphabet. That is what we are going to begin uncovering in this series is the story of God found in the Hebrew alphabet, which you can also pronounce as alphabet. For it is written, it is written in the zodiac in the heavens, it is written in the earth, it is written in your body. We are made in the image of God, in his image and likeness, and his word is written there. It is true, and we are living in a time when the true mysteries of God are really being revealed like never before. So there is so much to feast on in this time. There is no need for a famine of God's word and his truth in a time when there is a feast at the table. And God invites us to come and dine with him and eat and be filled. It's time to drink from the living waters waters where you will never thirst again. Once you've started discovering God, it is hard to stop. And that's why the Bible says it's better to have known him than to have, or it's better to not have known him than to have known him and and turned your back. That, That scripture has new meaning to me now because it is truly better to have not known him than to taste him and know about him and to walk away from what you knew and go live a life of misery because that's really what would happen uh, once you start knowing God and then you walk away from what you know. But in the universe of God, we are not doing that. We want to sit at the table and we are ready to feast and we are ready to dine with him and know him. Because really, it is not about religion anymore. It is about relationship. Religion has had its time. It has served its purpose. But really, we are out of the letter of the law and we are into the spirit of the law. And being in the spirit is in relationship. That's why we are today to be led by the spirit of God. um, And we're not trying to keep the letter of the law. Okay? Now, what I want you to understand is God has written the truth. He is, his word is written in, in the heavenlies and the stars. It's written in the archaeological record. It's written in the history of time. Okay, It is written in this body, in this temple. We are the temple of God for a reason. Because his word is written there. It's inscribed on our hearts now. Okay, and it's time that we begin to wake up to this truth of relationship with God. And I invite you today to start knowing Him. And we're going to take this journey into the Hebrew alphabet and know Him in this way. Again, I'm glad that you are tuning in and and taking this journey into knowing God through the Hebrew alphabet and understanding this story because it is a love story from a father to his children which should really give us great comfort in a world and in a time where many feel alone and lost uh, like never before. And there's so much, there's so many lies that we have to break through to get to the truth. And one of those lies, for example, is the lie of evolution. And I bring that up because when you realize and discover that you were created, it is it's so much better than just thinking that you evolved out of nothingness. But knowing that you were created by a father who loves you means not only do you have a purpose, but you go on to exist after this. And you have a father waiting to receive you. It means you are not alone. And you, you know, don't just exist by accident. But there's so much more to you than that. So it's really good news. But that's not the reason why we're gathering today. Um... So I'm going to digress from that and move on into the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, I am no expert. I am learning myself. And um, what I am learning so far, I am sharing with you. 
and I will tell you it has taken me a while to finally do this video because when I'm trying to learn about something I want to know I want to know as much as I can so I can just tie the puzzle pieces together and, and present it to you so that you can hear, so that you can see the truth in it um, and, and, you know, kind of removing the gaps and the questions. But, <laughs> you know, much like the universe of God, it's endless. It, the Hebrew alphabet is endless. It is so packed with meaning that someone like myself really can only scratch the surface. Uh, of information and I'm going to share what I've learned so far with you and we're going to start with the letter Aleph um, because again you know for the sake of time we're going to focus on one letter at a time. Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet. Now when you think alphabet just think alphabet. It starts with the letter A and the alphabet starts with the letter A or Aleph okay and you'll see in middle of uh, Middle Hebrew, it looks like, you know, a sideways A. Um, now, in the beginning, well, let me just start with saying Aleph is the first letter, uh, so therefore it's number one, numeral uno. Um, and in the early Hebrew writings, uh, there were pictographs, right? Uh, so there was a representation of an ox. So we see an ox as the um, initial writing of the letter Aleph. And there's very good reason for this. So, uh, Aleph is in the image of God, okay? And it's considered by Jew Jewish theologians um, to be the Lord and Master of all the letters because it is in the image of God. And you will discover that it really is in the image of God and how that's so. So, it's the Lord and Master of all the letters, a father with his 21 children. And what we see here in, in this description is all starts at, off as an ox, and it evolves over time into um, the letter Aleph that you see now, which is a letter that is three letters in one, right? So it takes on more encrypted form. It never disassociates from its original form. It evolves so that we can know more and we can know him more and know more about him. But God always meets us where we're at. So in the beginning of humanity, it starts off with an ox. He, he was meeting them where they're at and how they can know him. Now, what's interesting about the ox is um, the ox head symbolizes power and leadership. And the ox was the animal used to plow the land due to his great might. What is so interesting, however, is that God the Father is interested in plowing the ground of our hearts. So it's it's not a coincidence that we see uh, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the beginning of the story, starting back in time with an ox. It is a clue to something about the story. It's a clue to the condition of uh, the children of this father. Now, uh, Let's look at Jeremiah 4, 3. As surely as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness, then the nations will be blessed by him and in him they will glory. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts. Do not waste your good seed among the thorns. And really quickly, I want you to notice that the Lord is in all caps and you'll understand why soon. In Hosea 10 and 12, it says, Sow for yourselves righteousness and reap the fruit of loving devotion. Break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and sends righteousness upon you like rain. Now, in the ancient times, the ox had significance for, for leadership and power. It had, you know, the ability to plow up the hard ground for agriculture. So they really depended on this ox. This ox was pivotal to the culture. But spiritually, um, and, and we need to focus on spiritually because, you know, Jesus wants us to get into the spirit of the law and not the letter, right? So when it's time that we have the spiritual interpretation of these literal things and this history. So spiritually speaking, God is giving us a clue at the very beginning of the story that he has come to plow up the stony ground of our hearts. 
If you notice it says in truth and in righteousness, then the, then the nations will be blessed by him and in him they will glory. But what do they need to do to experience this truth, uh, righteousness, and justice, and these blessings and the glory of the Lord on them? They need to plow up the hard ground of their hearts. God is letting us know that in order to reap the fruit of loving devotion, um, that we need to sow righteousness. We need to break up the unplowed ground. So in the beginning of the story, God is after the heart of his children. There is a hardness in the heart of his children, and he comes in like an ox, leading the way to plow up the stony ground of the, the heart of his children. And this is good news for us, because even though we have a condition, God has left the solution, and he is persistently after us to, you know, to take away our heart of stone, as the word tells us, and give us a heart of flesh, okay, to soften us up so that we will know him. And that we can know his love. And this is very real. It's very true. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, growing up, you know, we grew up in a very religious environment. And a lot of that religious environment focused on us being bad and going to hell. And what's so amazing is how when I became an adult and when I developed a relationship with God, when I cried out to him, and my heart was softened to hear from him. He has just given so much love that it still blows my mind today to know how loving he actually is, right? And that's that's what he wants us to know. He, he There's a stony heart that doesn't allow us to know his love. And he's here to change that. And he's done a lot to change it. We're gonna discover more about it. Olive in God's image. Uh, by the way, Olive sounds like Olive, and while studying uh, these letters, it's something that I just discovered on my own, and when I went and researched Olive, you know, I think you're going to enjoy what I have to share about the Olive, uh, because I now know that it doesn't just sound like Olive, but it's clearly related. Um, so anyways, you know... We have the first letter, Allah, in God's image, a father with his 21 children. And something you should know is uh, all things begin with God, the father of all. He's the master of all the letters. He's the master. He's in the beginning, the creator and the father. And Allah Bet is a combination of the first two letters of uh, the Hebrew uh, alphabet, which is Allah Bet. Um, now, all of is also the three in one. So we're gonna we're gonna get away from the pictographic meaning of Olive as the ox, and we're gonna to start to discover today's Olive as the three in one. Uh, what we're gonna see is how, you know, over time we God shows us different facets of himself. He never changes, but like a diamond, you know, when the light is reflected on certain angles, we see different glory and different know different light reflected from him different manifestations of him he's been very gentle very patient and over time we have been able to know him more and more as he is as we can handle it and today like i said there's a feast uh, of knowledge and wisdom and understanding to know him because we're ready and it's time and this is why people are sick of they're sick of religion um because God wants them to come out of religion, I believe, and get into relationship. And it's okay to start in religion, but not all of us finish there um, once we start to really get in relationship with Him. Uh, and there's a reason for this. You know, there's a process, and God respects the process. It's like working with children. You can't tell the children that there's three billion letters in their DNA code. <laughs> you know, this is irrelevant to them. They don't, they don't relate to it. They don't understand it. It's not necessary. Uh, but you can tell them, you know, that they have a father, you know. And in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, you know, things that they can understand. Um, so we're, we're not talking about things for children now, but we're talking about meat and potatoes of the word. We, we, we must graduate from the baby food of the word and the literal interpretation of the scriptures and get into the more esoteric uh, 
you know, the, the graduate knowledge, the, the high school knowledge, um, because we're ready, we can handle it. Now, let's talk about the Olive as a three in one. But before we talk about that, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Yud, Bob, Yud are the three letters that make up the Olive. It gives us a visual to one thing consisting of three parts, symbolically God of the three in one. The Aleph numerically is valued as one. However, when you combine the three parts of the Aleph, the Yud, Vav, Yud, the numeric value evolves into 26. Now, this is not a new concept for many of us because we understand the Trinity. And, and today some people say, you know, the Trinity... Uh, know it's not real it's not Old Testament but I'm showing you right here in the beginning Aleph is reflecting the three in one the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit is in the first letter of the alphabet okay so the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit are in Aleph and we see one letter consisting of three things so this just gives us you know, again, uh, on the surface, the concept of God being one, he is one, but there are three parts that make up this one. Uh, the olive, well, before I discuss that, uh, I want you to see this image of the Holy Trinity. Kind of looks like a Christian fish symbol, right? Um, but again, this concept of the Trinity is not new. Um, it was there in the Old Testament. It was there at the beginning. Uh, you know, there's translations that say in the beginning, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the Elohim is plural. So El, you know, is God, but Elohim is plural. So the plurality of the very first statement, the very first scripture of the Bible uh, gives us the truth about their being the three in one so to speak just this is just on the surface we're, we're just on the surface of this thing but we want to talk about something uh, called God's sacred name the YHVH now some interpretations have YHWH uh, something about the vowels and uh, the dots in the letters and how it changes it and so people pronounce it Yahweh or yod heh vav heh if you use the V. It's the same name and there's a reason why it has these different pronunciations as well because they say that no one really knows how to say it. The Jews admit uh, that they don't know 100% how to pronounce this name. It's considered God's sacred name, okay? The name of God is the yod heh vav heh and it is so sacred and utterly holy, the Jews dare not speak it, so they audibly substitute Adonai or Lord, and especially since it is said that nobody again knows really 100% how to pronounce it. When the scribes of the Torah are, you know, writing the, the word of God on the scrolls, they say, I am about to write the name of God in honor of his holy name. Uh, because they have to be extremely careful when writing this name. It was sacred. There are, they are of utmost caution when dealing with the honorable name of God, which really makes me uh, think of the Ten Commandments when it says, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain, which is something that people do constantly all the time. You know, Christians, you know, whatever religion, people just, they take it in vain all the time. And there's a reason why we're told not to take his name in vain because, you know, you don't, if you're taking something in vain, it starts to lose its holiness. And God is holy, okay? And and, and even though we can relate to him, especially through Christ, uh, we need to understand that he is holy. And there was a holy of holies in the temple, uh, in the tabernacle, for a reason. Because there's a sacred place. Uh, so... Consider this, if a king were to address a scribe writing God's name, he may not pause to reply to him out of reverence for completion of the four sacred letters. Now, when we're talking about the yod heh vav heh in Greek, it is called the Tetragrammaton. And uh, 
The tetragrammaton is the Greek word for the sign of the four letters. The Bible translates it as Lord, so Lord is in all caps. And this is a substitute reflecting again the glory of God and that he's holy, worthy of respect and honor and praise forevermore. Amen. Now, when we see Lord in all caps, we will know that it's referring to the yod heh vav -Hey, or some say Yahweh. And again, God is giving us clues, you know, almost as if what form he is in when, when he's referencing himself in the text. And the Tetragrammaton, what we're going to discover is the Tetragrammaton is a geometric shape. And what we also see here is the yod heh vav -Hey takes on the form of a man. Remember, Aleph is in the image of God. Aleph is the yod heh vav -Hey. And here we see when we put the yod heh vav -Hey together, it reflects uh, the image and likeness of a man, okay? And then we see in that, it says, you know, earth, water, air, and fire, which makes up creation. Um, and we're not gonna go into that here, but it's all relevant. And this is known in the Zohar um, as the Adam Cademan or primordial man. It says it's symbolized by the juxtaposition of the four letters of the Tetragrammaton to form the likeness of a human figure. The figure is colored to permit visualiz visualization of the correspondences with the tree of life and the supernal triangles. So we see, you know, <laughs> we're going to discover that God is in everything. He's in the math, the geometry, the history, everything. And it's, it's amazing. Um, so the actual pronunciation of the YHVH or yod heh vav -Hey, was kept a secret by the Levitical priests traditionally and was then passed on from generation to generation in secret. The priest heard Yeshua or Jesus say the name of yod heh vav -Hey correctly and even publicly. To make matters more difficult, Yeshua is not from the tribe of Levi, Levi, I'm sorry, but the tribe of Judah. Excuse me. Um, and what I shared in another video series of mine is that Jesus uh, fulfilled the law to the point of death. Anyone claiming to be God or the Son of God um, was to, to be punished by death. And this was to make sure that no one, you know, walked around talking about he was the son of God, the Messiah, you know, claiming to be God because it would cost him his life. But because Jesus, you know, knew who he was, he was willing to die for what he believed. He was willing to die for his claims. So when he says it is finished, and when we say that Jesus has fulfilled the law, which is what the Bible tells us, we understand that. He fulfilled the law to the point of death. He had to die for his claims and he was willing to do that. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. Okay. His claim was him laying his life down to claim what he was claiming. And this is a good, a good thing for us to glean from in a time like this in 2020, where we need to understand that we need to be willing to stand for something or we are going to fall for anything. And we just can't afford to do that in a time like today uh, when we are really spearheading into a new world. So anyhow, again, Jesus died for his claims of being God and he fulfilled the law which made him qualified, okay, to, to be the savior, uh, you know, and, and qualified to be called the Christ. Anyhow, moving on, we're going to talk about the I am that I am. Now, what we're, what I'm doing is, this is a progression through, uh, through Olive, okay? And you're going to see later how Olive is mark, marking the spot so we can track God, so we can find him, so we can know him and not be led astray or deceived by, you know, other doctrines, other gods, so forth and so on. The Ahaya Asher Ahaya. When Moses asked God who should he say had sent him, God replied, I am that I am. The I am that I am is the Ahaya Asher Ahaya. Scholars support the common belief 
that Yohimake, or Yahweh, is a peculiar sort of verb of to be, which means I am. And you'll see here, Haya is he was, Yiye, he will be, Hava, he is. The Hebrew writing of Ahaya, Asher Ahaya, reads as words starting with the letter Aleph or A. So it's God putting his stamp and his seal, okay? on things so we know it's him and we know it's of him and from him which means it's from the tree of life uh, if we take the breaking down of the word then we can see the words of the I am that I am begin with God the Aleph the first the beginning and the yod heh vav or Yahweh the Hebrew writing of the Ahaya Asher Ahaya reads as words starting again with Aleph or A and what you see here is in Middle Hebrew, uh, Hebrews read right to left. In Middle Hebrew, we see the A or the Aleph starting every word of the I am that I am. So when he says I am that I am has sent me, we, we know who that is. But you won't know who that is um, if, if you don't know anything about him, if you, if you didn't understand some of this information you wouldn't know uh, but the Israelites they knew and, and they should have known uh, you know that God had sent Moses just because of the statement I am that I am because Aleph marks the spot and it's, it's the seal of, of God's name okay now this is just an example of how Aleph marks the spot I am begins with Aleph. Remember Hebrews reading right to left. Light begins with Aleph. Love begins with the letter Aleph. A sign begins with the letter Aleph. Truth begins with the letter Aleph. And the Amen or Amen begins with the letter Aleph. Okay? Now, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and the way can even be interpreted as a sign, um, a path. Now, the reason why this is important is because as we talk about the olive, we also are talking about the three in one. We're talking about the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see that you know Jesus Christ is showing us who he is. He's giving us several clues as to who he is and where he comes from and why he can say that he is the Son of God. Now, the five names of God have an associated numerical value that will lead to the letter Aleph. Without going into too much detail, however, regarding how we arrive at the numerical value of each letter or word, I think it's just really best to share the names. The numerical value and the fact that all these words or names begin, these names of God begin with the letter Aleph. Now, why is this important? Well, for starters, it's revealing how Aleph marks the spot of identification with the words uh, connected to God, the God that it's referring to. Again, it's as if Yahweh Elohim puts his mark on his name and character with the seal of his letter Aleph. Now, I cannot say this is something that is always the case. However, when we go to the root of the story, the history of God or his story, we find him strategically and even discreetly or mystically placing his mark on his territory. If we study and track the evidence of the God of the Aleph, the God of the universe, um, who is Yahweh or Yone Bate, and goes by many names to describe and display who he is and what he's like, then the Hebrew Aleph Bet is a great place to start and it may be the best place. It is the place of origin. Yah, the 15th letter of the Torah, is Aleph, and Yah uh, has a numerical value of 15. Yod Heh Vav Heh is the 26th letter of the Torah, or which is the Bible, the Old Testament. Um, the 26th letter of the Torah is uh, Aleph, and Yod Heh Vav Heh has a value of 26. L, um, the 31st letter of the Torah is Aleph, and L has a value of 31. The 86th letter of the Torah is Aleph, and Elohim has a value of 86, and Av. 
The third letter of the Torah is Aleph, and Av, which means father, is has a value of three. So what you begin to see is how God is establish, establishing himself even as the beginning and the end, just by revealing himself in letters, words, mathematic equations, and even geometry. If we look at the Tetragrammaton, and what, uh, well, when we look at the Tetragrammaton, we see this, this geometry found here, this, this mathematic equations found here, um, associated with these letters, the yod heh vav -Hey. What is beautiful about uh, all of this is that it's done through the Aleph, just for starters. Now, uh, in Exodus 3.13, Moses, you know, says uh, he wants to know who, should, who he should say had sent him. And, you know, he's referring to himself as the Elohim. And we see that Elohim uh, starts with the letter Aleph and is associated with Aleph and the Father. According to G Jewish theology, the two halves of God's four-letter name, yod heh vav -Hey, represent the two parts of his attributes being judgment and mercy. The first two letters, yod heh point to the letter Aleph, like numerous other titles for God. However, the remaining two letters of his name, vav -Hey, are derived by counting uh, the number value of Meshiach Yeshua, which represents another attribute of God, which is his mercy. So, what I want, I want to go to Zechariah 14 9. Let's jump on over to Zechariah 14 9. I had one of those slides out of place that kind of threw me off. Um, so, we're talking about the Yod Heh Vav Heh. Yod Heh Vav Heh will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one yod heh vav -Hey, and his name, one. So, again, even though we have different manifestations of life or God revealing himself to us over time, the Lord thy God is still one, okay? What you begin to see is how God is establishing himself, um, again, through the letters and numbers and the geometry of this tetragrammaton, and you're going to see how. Uh, but what I want you to understand about Zechariah 14, 9, it's only through Jesus Christ or the re revelation of Yeshua that the character of God's name, yod heh vav -Hey, can really be realized or known in its fullness. And that's the key to this. And without that key, you're, you're stuck. You're stuck in the letter of the law. You're stuck in the literal interpretation. You're stuck in the, in the past. You know, you're stuck in something that is a foreshadow of things to come and that are here and have been here. Uh, so, you know, you need to come into a relationship with God and know him through his son. That's why his son is the door. Um, we must know God through this light now. Because this light reveals the Old Testament to us. It reveals the Father. Now, what I want you to notice is the features of this cube. Now, uh, let's look at 1 Kings and Matthew and Revelation. It's going to help us to understand something about this tetragram of Tom Q, this yod heh vav -Hey. This shape with 26 features is relevant if we take into account God's dwelling place in the past, um, in the present, and in the future. In the past, he dwelt in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a perfect cube, and in the future, he will dwell in the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is also a perfect cube, and right now, in the present moment, he dwells within us, right? We are the temple of God right now. The kingdom is within us. And who are we? Well, God, the Father, calls us the salt of the earth. And what's interesting is the salt crystal happens to be the only cube found in nature. Now this cube has 12 identical edges, 8 identical corners, and 6 identical surfaces. Which is amazing because that equals to 26. And we know that uh, Allah equals 26, even though it's the first letter. Because it is made up of 3 letters, the Yod, Bob Yod, or Yud Bob Yud, uh, we know that it equals to 26, okay? Now, 
let's look at first Kings. Then he prepared an inner sanctuary within the house in order to place there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. You see, Lord is in all caps. Okay, so right there it's referring to this yod hey vav hey, this tetragrammaton cube. Um, the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, and 20 cubits in height. This was in the past. Okay, now in the present, we're the salt of the earth, right? Matthew 5 13. And in the future, uh, Revelation 21, 16, the city was laid out like a square. Here we have this square, this geometrical shape again, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. Equal sides, basically. Now, we're going to talk about the uh, gospel ladder. To become more like him, our Father, which art in heaven. Now, what I want you to notice really quickly is this picture. Um, a guy from Enter the Stars gave uh, a revelation of Christ carrying the cross up the hill, okay, to where he was going to be crucified, which was at Golgotha, the place of the skull, which is encrypted, of course, it's packed with meaning, and I love it. Um, because, you know, there's really so much to know the truth and the Father. Uh, and again, we want to know our Father. We, Everybody wants to know their Father. Everybody wants a good relationship with their Father. Um, even if they never had that, they long for that. There's a reason um, why, you know, we have marriage and families. This dynamic and design comes from the original family, okay? Now, anyhow... When Jesus is carrying this cross, it's an X. It's showing us the curse. He is carrying the curse. He's carrying our sin. This sinless uh, man is carrying our sin. And he's taking our curse and offering us blessing. Because this X, this curse, will stand upright and form a cross when he goes to be crucified. And so we, we see that he is taken our unrighteousness, our curse, and he has clothed us in righteousness. If we will accept it, if we if we will believe, and if we will, we will accept this gift. And it's hard to accept this gift uh, if you don't believe that, you know, you, you're, you sin and that you do wrong and that you have things you need to be forgiven for. But again, this, this cross starts off as the curse that he's carrying. And then when he gets to the top of the hill to be crucified, this uh, X turns into a cross. It's upright. Okay, so he, he is clothing us in righteousness. Um, while it is not God's desire to make us gods, it is his desire to conform and fit us for fellowship with him. We are created in the image and likeness of God, making fellowship with him both possible and natural. And due to the entry and degradation of sin, that was changed. However, through the mediator, uh, Yeshua, Christ Jesus, the fellowship is restored. Excuse me, I needed to take a drink. Uh, and, and again, we see this curse has He's taken our curse and offered us blessing. He's taken our unrighteousness and offered us righteousness. And that's why if we don't start to see the scriptures and the Old Testament through, you know, the light of Christ, this fellowship can't be restored, you know, because we're stuck in an old thing, you know. And just like the Bible tells us, Jesus told them, you know, uh, you can't put old wine in new wine skins. You just can't. First Timothy uh, chapter 2 verse 5 through 6 for there's one God and one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men and in John 1 uh, chapter 1 verse 51 it says truly truly I say to you you shall see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man it is interesting to note that Jewish theologians see the letter Aleph as likened to a ladder placed on the ground reaching heavenward consisting of an upper yod and a lower yod, in which the upper yod denotes the celestial and the lower yod denotes the mundane. 
This is a direct parallel to what Yeshua uh, said in the biblical passage of John chapter 1, verse 51, and it illustrates the base, basic gospel message in Aleph. The picture of the gospel ladder is more complete when we recognize that Yod is not just the name of the letter, but it is the word for hand. The message of the gospel is further displayed in the construction of Aleph by the leaning law, which connects uh, God's hand, the upper Yod, with the hand of man, the lower Yod. Now, Leonardo da Vinci made a picture, and it was, you know, it's understood that this picture was encrypted with spiritual meaning, and it gives us an illustration, of, uh, an illustration of what I just shared with you, with God reaching His hand out to Adam, this God of heaven reaching from heaven down to earth to Adam. Okay, this upper yod reaching down to the to the lower yod, um, the yod hey you know, in, in the upper waters, reaching down to man, God reaching out to man. And what's interesting, someone shared this a long time ago, was that this really is a brain. This picture uh, is, is just loaded with meaning. It's a brain. It looks like a brain. It's evidence we are moving from literal to spiritual interpretation, just as Jesus advised. We see this literal, literal picture packed with spiritual meaning. Um, and this, again, is a great illustration of God reaching out to man with this upper yod and lower yod, um, the hand of God reaching to the hand of man. So, man is made in the image of God, and Christ Jesus is the hope of glory in you. This is not an accident. We are made in the image of God and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it tells us we're made in the image of God. And in the New Testament, it tells us Christ Jesus is the hope of glory in you. Okay? There's a reason for this. Um, Genesis 1.27, God made man in his image. and In the image of God created he him. Something amazing is how the letters of God's name, the yod heh vav -Hey, can be seen visually as a man when arranged in descending order. Although the, le the letters can illustrate a person, a body, or man, it does not denote that God looks like a man with arms, legs, and a head necessarily. Um, because we don't know what he looks like, right? So who am I to say that he does look, you know, exactly this way? He is spirit. Um, but in Hebrew, the word for image is translated as tezalim which is a word referring to the essence of a thing and not only the outward appearance. God has made man not only in his image or essence, but in his likeness. We have been created by God with emotions, a sense of humor, and the ability to love. I want you to notice really quickly, uh, again, this tetragrammaton laid out uh, Horizontally, we see the yod heh vav -Hey, and laid out vertically is in the image, uh, is a man, is the form of a man, okay? Um, and Christ came, you know, back to connect us to the Father and restore fellowship. Uh, and so, you know, it also makes me think of the cross. But um, let's get let's get back to the image of God. Uh, because God has these same likenesses, being a God who has emotions and sense of humor and love, um, you know, we can relate to him. With all that being said, our ability to reflect God's image is a different story. And we see throughout the history of man and in the Bible that the image of God has been marred by man's sin condition. When we understand this simply, we can understand the need for salvation, which comes from the last half of God's name being Bob Hay. The representation of Messiah is Yeshua, uh, who makes it possible for the image of God to be restored in us. He, you know, He's the door. He, he's the way back to the Father. Father, He's the way for us to know the Father. Um, you know, and to get out of of the letter of of the law and get into the spirit of the law. And we need the Holy Spirit to do that. 
I remember a long time ago, um, you know, a pastor was sharing how people tell him, you know, they live according to the Bible and um, they live according to whatever the Bible says and, and that's how they live their lives. Um, you know, very literal to what the Bible is saying and what what he really wanted people to understand was that we're supposed to live in the Spirit now. We need the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit, which comes through Christ, the door, to enlighten us to what the Scriptures have been telling us, what's beneath the surface. And in order to know what is beneath the surface, we have to go through the door. If we stand at the door in the Old Testament, looking at the shadow of things to come, we never go through the door and see what is here. We never go through the door and see the light. Get out of the shadows and get into the light. Go through the door of Christ so the Holy Spirit can enlighten you to the spiritual understanding of the scriptures. Because we need to walk according to the Spirit. The Spirit interprets the scriptures for us in our, in our daily lives. It leads us. It guides us, you know, decision after decision, situation after situation. It is the light on our path, okay? Um, so, while we can see the image of God uh, being expressed through the trio of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so too we can see the same pattern we have been fashioned after in us being a body, soul, and spirit, pattern after God's image. In the image of God, as man is made, so two aspects of the Aleph apply to man. The Trinitarian aspects of the Aleph are aspects of us being tripart beings. Again, made in the Father's image. Tripart. He's one made of three. We're, look at us. We're one. We're a body. You know, you have your name. <laughs> you have a name. You're a person. But you consist of three parts. Parts that you can't see. The body is what you can see. Christ was what you could see of God, okay? But the spirit, the soul, is what you can't see, what's inside. So, just as the Vav is seen in Jewish, uh, by Jewish theologians as a ladder stretching between the upper and lower Yod, so too the soul dwells in the midst of the spirit and the body. Just as Vav is the dominant figure in Aleph, so too the Father is the dominant figure of the Godhead. He's the head, right? The ox, the head, the leader. He's the head of the Godhead first, number one. And the soul is the dominant part of man. Just as the visible Yeshua expressed the personality of the invisible Father, so too the visible flesh of our body expresses itself through the invisible soul. Our bodies contain our souls, and the soul interacts with the physical world through the body uh, with its words, deeds, and gestures. Yeshua was God's visible expression, okay? Making him literally God in the flesh with his actions and words expressing the Father's personality. Yeshua reminds us in the Bible that he came to do the will of his Father, to express his Father's words and actions through the body of Jesus Christ. And just as our body is sensitive to the physical realm, so too our spirits are sensitive to the spiritual realm. You know, you can get around somebody and you can sense their energy. You can enter, uh, you know, into somebody's aura, basically, this, this field of energy that you can't see, but you can feel it, but you're sensitive to it, okay? Let's remember Yeshua is called the Word, God's physical expression. Hebrews 1 and 2, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. So if, you don't, if you're not aware of that, then you know, you're really outdated, okay? You really don't have a new revelation of the Father. Um, you're really missing a lot of pieces to the puzzle. It doesn't mean you have nothing. It just means that, you know, you kind of have an old understanding of the Father. Uh, he's, he's made it to where we need to know Him through His Son, through this one source for a reason. Uh, and through this one source comes just 
many avenues of revelation, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and true enlightenment. Yeshua referred to himself as the beginning and the end, the first and the last, Alpha and Omega, which is also a proclamation of himself as, as God's Aleph Bet, being from A to Z, or Aleph to Tav, through whom the Father speaks. You see, it is only through Jesus Christ, or Yeshua, that the revelation of, of Yeshua, um, that the character, I'm sorry, let me restate that, it's only through Jesus Christ, or the revelation of Yeshua, that the character of God's name, Yohei he can be realized or known in its fullness. So if you're, you know, if you're just in the Old Testament with your with your understanding, um, you you really don't have the the new revelation of this age. Uh, you know, you're you're missing pieces to this. And you know, it's really time. I mean, if we want to talk about evolution, evolution, uh, you know, happens on a soul level, on an individual level, but it's not something that happens in creation with men. You know, that's not how that works. And there's a lot more to uncovering uh, the Aleph. Um, there, there's much more esoteric meaning. But again, um, I really had to, <laughs> I really had to stop studying and trying to fit it all in. Um, and and I felt like, you know, what I'm sharing is is relevant for Aleph, and it's things that you know we really could benefit uh, from understanding at this time. So. In conclusion to uh, uncovering Aleph in the Hebrew alphabet, I wanted to talk about the Aleph. Remember, Aleph sounds like olive. So I have some things I want to share with you. And you can, you know, do your own interpretation of this, but a quick look at this similar sounding Aleph, right? Now, Aleph is highly symbolic in the Bible and in the Hebrew culture as well as a powerhouse of health benefits. I only point this out because of its blessed nature, and we find it oddly similar again to the sound of Aleph. Now let's take a closer look, and we can probably gain insight. It's first mentioned in scripture when the dove returned to Noah's ark carrying an olive branch in its beak. Um, and since that time, the olive branch has been a symbol of peace to the world. And we often hear the expression, extending an olive branch to another person as a desire for peace. The spiritual meaning of olive. The olive tree is a symbol of many values in Jewish life. It's mentioned frequently in the Bible in the context of blessings, fruitfulness, and health. It is obvious that the olive tree symbolizes stability and tranquility. Moreover, the olive symbolizes the eternal link between man and the earth. And this is amazing um, because the olive symbolizes an eternal link. And, you know, we're just discussing, we're discussing the olive, you know, which is the father who lives in eternity. Um, but again, it symbolizes the eternal link uh, between man and the earth. Now, it's also uh, it's also very rich in uh, health and biblical blessing, right? So what does the olive mean in Hebrew? The, the state of Israel chose the olive leaves around the door as an emblem. The olive leaves again symbolize peace. Um, and the olive also symbolizes light as the oil produced from the olive light of the menorah in the olive tree in the Bible. The olive tree was revered in the biblical period for its glory, the freshness of its evergreen leaves, and the strength of its roots that can even penetrate rocks. Isn't that interesting? The strength of its roots can even penetrate rocks? We were just talking about, you know, how the Father wants to plow the ground, the rocky ground of our hearts. And here we have an olive whose roots can penetrate rocks. <laughs> so um, I think that that's a connection there. The prophet Jeremiah described it. The Lord called your name a green olive tree, beautiful with goodly fruit. Now, 
The Mount of Olives is frequently mentioned in the New Testament as a part of the route from Jerusalem to Bethany and the place where Jesus stood when he wept over Jerusalem. Jesus ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives. That's another interesting fact. Jesus ascended to heaven back to the Father from the Mount of Olives <laughs> or Olives. I believe that we have made a connection with Olive that is packed with nutrition and health benefits. Again, it's a powerhouse of nutritional benefits. And if you look here at these 11 health benefits, you will see that Olive um, has nutritional benefits that stem from head to toe. I mean, it's true holistic health in the Olive. It's rich in healthy monosaturated fats, high in antioxidants, has strong anti-inflammatory properties, may help prevent stroke, protects against heart disease, may fight Alzheimer's disease, so a cognitive strengthener, may reduce type 2 diabetes risk, antioxidants also have anti-cancer properties, it can help treat rheumatoid arthritis, it has antibacterial properties, and it's the healthiest fat on earth. This is head to toe health when you think about it. Um, so, you know, I thought it was interesting and worth sharing. Make your own conclusions, but I'm convinced that Olive uh, and Olive are kinfolk, okay? <laughs> that Olive, you know, is, is really a representation of the goodness of our Father who, you know, blesses us from head to toe, covers us 360 degrees. Now, I'm going to conclude this, and I hope that you've enjoyed learning about the olive, and I will see you in the next part of our series. Thanks for tuning in.